We are getting near the end here, but we have been fortunate enough to have the foreign minister um, with us. Anneke Utfeldt to be here for the last half hour to discuss uh, <clears throat> and she's been sitting here listening. Uh, she had to take a break and do something in, uh, in the foreign office, but she came back. So it's a tall order to sum up the whole conference. But uh, um, Anakin, we felt we heard a lot about the doctrine in uh, today. Who was it? Morton School Guru. Uh, maybe this is uh, all in my political life. I pointed to the positive trends. Some go backward, some, most of them go uh, forward. When we talk about various contexts and the accounting we gave last year, I said I wish I were more optimistic that I can't be. Things look uh, uh, disturbing. That's the reality we live in right now. But there are some developmental things that um, the green transition are going a little bit speedier. And uh, that uh, free trade has helped us the last 30 years, has helped to some extent. But then there has been a major crisis uh, with climate that Norway can contribute in some regard. When we talk about the job of foreign policy to make a domestic policy possible, all of that is used to help um, the things that have happened in Europe have given us less space to operate domestically, as she say. In the beginning of the conference, um, um, there was a response to some of these logos. You must say a little bit about what that, for some of them know what they mean, but perhaps you could say a little bit, explain what they are. And we can discuss what the goal is. We heard us, the toy, the Reflex project and uh, led to innovation and so on. Can you just say a few words, uh, the, the architecture about it? We're going to throw up some balls and, and um, projects and say this is, uh, these are the directions we're headed. That's interesting, but I and the Foreign Office, we need to have some clear guidelines, clear thoughts about where we're headed. But what are you going to do? Are you going to have many meetings? And we're going to see if we have white papers or however we go, but foreign policy, uh, we have to prioritize the area that we're going to focus on. Um, we've had throughout since the 90s into this age, uh, all those uh, projects we've had, we can't necessarily continue with all of that. We have to, to prioritize what is our doctrine now. There are many things that are stable, but because of what Toya says, so we live in a world in change, and uh, that's certainly true. And. We are a neighbor of Russia, and we can't change that. And so uh, NATO membership, that is a, a fundamental with, for us. But the thing that came up today that has been talked about, I quite agree with, and that is our room for negotiation with um, uh, the states has been limited. I disagree. It will be different if they come back with a position of authority. But those who were in the previous administration had very little knowledge about uh, areas where Norway had a lot of knowledge. So they didn't make use of our knowledge. But what we do, if you're going to criticize something where we take a role in certain conflicts, I don't think we're trying to take sides. I don't think that's what we're doing. There is a competence, a skill set that's uh, uh, desired, and I think that we are better than many countries at supplying that. But let's go back to that about the United States. There is very little re to the, in regard to the response project. Uh, we said we're going to go out and have seven or eight meetings and so on. Uh, all over Norway about various subjects and what topics are the most important for foreign policy and talk to our partners and talk about different subjects. And then we're going to gather information and so on. Why do we have a debate like this? What is the purpose of that? Is it because we don't already have the ideas we need? Or is it because we, we know what we want but we need to change our policies? Or what is it? Or is it that we want to make change, or 
or to prepare for change, or, or we thought, well, we don't want to do so much, and we're just going to let, you know, let things go along as before. I'm not trying to be cheeky here, but um, let's try to clarify what our goal is with this. Because all kinds of studies are initiated because we want to do make a genuine change, of course. Other times, I feel like these are just killing time. We're living in a different age than we once did for five years ago, even. If we look at uh, Norwegian uh, politics, is characterized by our broad skill set about um, Russia that other countries have uh, limited. And we've had a good deal of insight and knowledge about our neighbor before 2024. That has given us a great deal of insight and made us a good contributor. We need that same expertise in other areas, among other things. We need it with regard to China. And I'm very uh, concerned now that we're living in a time uh, that's more dangerous. Uh, we have a dangerous neighbor. Uh, OK, so we want to uh, call up this Cold War mentality and put China insert them into that same framework and act on the basis of previous experience. That's what I'm afraid is going to happen. That's why we need to broaden this picture uh, <clears throat> with those uh, messages here. What are our options so that we don't go into these old ways of thinking? We, need, we see the contours of what once was, but that we need a competence to understand that it's not the same. We need it with regard to Asia, with regard to Africa, and this picture that we heard painted also today, that there are big differences between the continents. Look at South Africa. Uh, the way we've looked about South Africa hasn't been right, uh, that they've been a spokesman for Africa, but that's not the case. And uh, the way people speak about India is not quite right. We need more confidence than before, more skills than before. Co the reality is more complex, uh, both with regard to Africa and other parts of the world. We need to develop this foreign policy that we are going to carry out. It's fantastic. Those of us who work with skill sets and competence and all of that. And if we want to uh, try to, uh, I have to thank the Foreign Office that really understands this and, and uh, conducts research into that area. So uh, you've had a lot of good investment in that regard to that. I'm thankful for that. Previously today, we heard about different years that were mentioned. Uh, Hamna asked, is it after 1930, 40, 1914, 1939 moment that we uh, refer to? Maybe Beckerville says maybe 1951. You are an historian yourself. It's not always easy to bring in historical events and then compare them with what happened today, but but uh, you, you, she, she, the foreign minister is uh, an historian. What do you think about the age that we, about the age that we're living in? Are we in an historic period? You've been a uh, foreign minister for a year, but uh, you were a member of the um, uh, foreign policy and defense. There, uh, uh, she's saying that I had four f footnotes. Uh, where would you place us as an historian, uh, our situation? Where, where's the drama? Where do you see us in the continuity or a breach? I think that the, and from 1982 to 2022, I think, um, those years that I began to study the world, that's when the world opened up as far as I saw. And then historians will discuss. It started before. It started actually in uh, 2014. We saw a change in Russian politics. No, no. Uh, when Putin was reelected, I came back. I came to Moscow some years ago. This was uh, this was around the time when this Chinese guy was given the Nobel Peace Prize. And then the, uh, we had the uh, chess uh, tournament that was the world championship in Norway. And Knut Hauge, 
who is uh, leader of a, uh, a security committee. He had to postpone his pension. But to, he said there are some changes involving Russia. And over time, we saw that he was right. How the universities and research institutes and cultural institutions have been under pressure. So first and foremost, with regard to Russia, that they have a common history. Uh, not sure that other, all the countries in the world see things the same way. One of the things that I'm wondering about as I sat and listened here at this conference, when you think about how the world changes and how little Norway seems to change, that's an important aspect. Norway does change because the, Nor the world changes, but during the period that you talked about, from 1989 to 2022, one of the major changes is that Norway has become a very wealthy nation. No country in world history has uh, had so much that they could invest abroad. We had 14, 15 billion. Uh, it's absurd when you think of the other countries and what they've had in comparison. If you look at the uh, oil fund, uh, it's even more. But if you go to another website, you can see these uh, astronomical sums that we have available. But things have changed that have changed our relationship with the world, has it not? Um, uh, four or five crowns uh, that goes into our, uh, from the fund, goes into our budget. We can quite catch the point with that. We have invested four times the gross national product uh, abroad, <coughs> uh, up to 60 billion crowns abroad. How do you look at that? This is not necessarily part of the uh, Foreign Office, but it's an important part of Norway's international relations. That creates a different type of uh, dependency on the uh, Norwegian welfare state is dependent on that. It changes, too, how we look at the world, does it not? But we haven't heard much about that here. What do you think about that? Yes. It changed a lot, both because we have earned a lot, but not least the countries we have invested in. I use a lot of time to explain how these decisions about how this pension money is going to be used. I'm not the one who makes these ethical decisions. So when I tell people why, I said I can't do that because it's not in my mandate. Uh, so, But I will take a good telephone, or I encourage them to call somebody. Uh, uh, that's the way it is. If I say that, they will kick me out. They'll fire me. Uh, it's the government that tries. Uh, people don't seem to understand how government is not free to just control everything. But the, the decisions about where and how and how much to invest, that's more complex. Thank you for that. But... Um, But riches in Norway, uh, what I'm thinking about, uh, what kind of foreign policy, how are you going to conduct a foreign policy that is going to uh, safeguard our interests? The, the fact is that we earn uh, a lot uh, from global trade. So the, a, a trade war is not in Norway's interests. Norway has come farther from being a non-subject some years ago. And today, when we mentioned China, China. So the headlines are so dramatic, you have to kind of push back on it so that we don't fall into the same trap that Russia is. But we've, uh, now we can identify our more vulnerabilities and uh, both uh, both in the sea and uh, trains, uh, whatever sector it is, Norway must continue to be a global player. 
We uh, have uh, we have benefited from lower tariffs, for example. So the discussion about the security policies, I think, has uh, uh, made progress lately, and it can make even more progress. I do agree. I think that's a very reasonable way uh, that this. Uh, the thing is, uh, to use what you know about Russia to apply to China, that would be wrong. But the alternative is to think about how do we relate to risk, the whole issue of risk. How do you determine what risk is? And I just want to say, in this uh, study, in but in the world there, uh, there's a lot of money that is lost when you uh, de-globalize. I also meet this in question about human rights. That when you're talking about human rights, people say, why don't you introduce sanctions there? And um, Norwegian industry is afraid to invest in other countries because there's a greater risk that they m might have be sanctioned. But in Norway, we have a lot of openness and transparency with regard to Norwegian industry. But Russia is an exception, where we isolate uh, many other countries. When we have done this with sanctions, it hasn't always worked out very well. Uh, to, uh, you take with Cuba, that uh, you, Cuba, look at how many years has done that. Look at what is accomplished, not much. So I don't think that general economic uh, sanctions are going to have um, a lot of effect. Of course, it will for individuals. But if you shut out a country from the international economy, that that's going to lead to major change, <laughs> uh, I don't believe that. This morning, we heard the uh, Prime Minister Stara, he said that one of those things that was important, he thought, is our relationship to Europe. He talked about this green shift and um, a partnership with industry. He, it sounded like he talked about he wanted us to be a member of the EU, but he stopped. But he went pretty far. He was pushing that a little bit, I thought. But he didn't really. Is there a limit to how much cooperation we can have with the EU when we're not a member? before people begin to get the idea that uh, we've come over into a, uh, or we're more inside than outside or, or outside of our comfort zone. Or where, where are you in this regard? Uh, within the government, some of you in the government are for and some against, but where are you in this regard? What is your position? You must look at old TV to clips where I'm demonstrating against Norwegian uh, European uh, Union in 1994. And uh, Gru Harlem Brundtland was there. She was the prime minister at the time. She said, there are two girls behind me that are demonstrating. See, Brundtland was four, and then she was standing behind her and was against. But here's what I think. There are advantages and um, uh, disadvantages for Norway to be a member of UU. It's been And the difficulty is that we have to implement things that the EU says. That has increased. The EU has more to say about health, for example. We got um, uh, vaccines because of the uh, Economic European Community Agreement that we're members of. So that's been important for us. And we've been uh, we've benefited from that with regard to health, the, the, the policies there. But I do agree with the, the Prime Minister. I don't think it's relevant to compare the EU with NATO. First of all, those countries that have uh, joined NATO, uh, no, the EU, the, you can, that goes quicker than it does to become a member of NATO. You talk about the war in Ukraine and with Czechoslovakia in 1948. Uh, these things are very, very important. So I don't think you can compare membership in the one compared to the other. But to answer your question, I was invited to a meeting of the uh, foreign policy uh, from the EU uh, members, 
and he wanted me to be a part of that meeting. And I, I said, in 1962, and France said no. In 1972, we negotiated a long time, and the Norwegian people said no at that time. And then later on, the Norwegian people said no a second time. So the thing is that uh, when we want to come, they won't let us in, and when we they want us in, but we don't. And I don't think it's it's uh, relevant for us to take the initiative when people don't want to to use up our negotiation uh, goodwill when there's not uh, more support among the people for that. I don't think it's the right way to go. But I do believe the discussion will come up uh, again. I think the discussion might be different if uh, the Great Britain had been along there. If we follow, see what's happening there, it will come for sure. And there may be different aspects that come up, and maybe the EU will be a bulwark against uh, uh, tyranny. You look at the United States, it is going a different way, uh, so that the United uh, Europe has to take more responsibility for its own military support and so on. And in climate, uh, it's important that uh, Norway cooperates with the EU. And so Norway has a privileged position toward the EU. There has never been as much interest as in the EU. We have a positive, they have a positive relationship with Norway. So he made a joke there. But the thing is, in the 50s, we had, we had a Norwegian minister who was a, a, a minister and he came back to the parliament and said, oh, it's very difficult to go out in the world and to explain to people that uh, this balls is an industrial product that uh, shouldn't be, uh, be uh, have tariffs. But certain other products should have 50% uh, tariffs. It was very difficult. Always, Norway has always been active. That fish and uh, fish and meat have always been handled differently in terms of tariffs. <laughs> They're d dealt with by two different uh, organizations. But maybe we're having a little of the same thing. There was food, and you have two categories: fish and and uh, meat. And then you have energy, two categories. The one is fossil and molecules, and the other is electrons, uh, electric, the energy market. Uh, Maybe this is a, a sad combination, but nobody in Norway is a, is against uh, the molecular or electrical development. But no, uh, there is a lot of tension with electricity production itself, with cables, um, undersea cables, uh, and various types of renewable energy. And the uh, governing parties have very clear positions in this. Uh, there are a lot of rules and regulations in the energy market within Europe. It must be very difficult for you to relate to in the parliament. Why, do you, why is that, do you think? If you didn't think it was difficult, I think you would have done things quicker than you have. But OK, how do you look at this? How do you look at a EU in the terms of this constitutional area, in terms of a partnership with regard to energy and these things? First of all, it's a little bit easier to relate to the EU after the war broke out. I was very often in Brussels as a member of parliament to stunt the government's policy. for, uh, you know, exploration of gas in the Norway. Uh, there wasn't that much of, of Europe saying, we don't want this type of energy, we want that type. That wasn't that a lot of that at that time. The thing is, unless you have security issues with the one type, you're not necessarily going to talk about the need to switch. But new options have been opened up for Norway now. With regard to other countries, I use a lot of time to say, 
uh, they tell other countries don't struggle against this because there are lots of advantages in having this green shift. So that part of our cooperation with the EU has gone well. But uh, the uh, current crisis in Norway, there's a lot of tension around these things. Yes, and there is a wish that if we only uh, control more, people think, then that the uh, price of electricity will go down. Not only here in Norway, but in many EU countries, if you turn that around. Uh, what I experience is that that when you have a need to find the reason for increased um, energy prices. And often we blame what's happening abroad. But from the people in the EU, they think we are the culprit because we are a big supplier of energy. So they can turn that around and blame us. And it's not the time to increase the tension there. And I haven't seen any other EU countries that have cut this uh, lowered their transfer uh, of energy as a, re uh, a response to what we've done. So I don't think it's very fruitful to do anything about that kind of energy uh, cooperation that has served our interests well. But uh, uh, this cable, undersea cables have always been uh, a controversial subject. And if we're going to have it or not have it, if we didn't have that, we would be very vulnerable. Uh, the, it, uh, to an energy crash. But uh, many, we've heard many uh, people speak about um, when you think uh, about forgetting the South, when we think in terms of global, for example, Africa, say a couple of words about that. It's very important because this fits into the discussion. What are your thoughts about Africa and what we should be doing there? I'll say a little about Africa and a lot about the global because there's not much time left. First of all, uh, some uh, commerce is more important than other. Uh, foreign uh, aid is not so big for Africa, but to have allies in the South has given us um, a breakthrough where we wouldn't have had it otherwise. So I do believe quite fundamentally that in the African countries, globally speaking, things, uh, if you try to boycott people and think that's going to help increase uh, humanitarian considerations, I don't have any faith in that. We're going to continue with dialoguing with other countries, even with countries that disagree with us in, in key areas when it concerns Africa. And that means uh, understanding uh, not just commerce, but how can we help in other areas like the green shift? We, there is a lot of uh, concern and interest in what Norway can have to contribute to that. And it says uh, three o'clock here. So let me just say that we need to uh, round off. Let me just say thank you so much to all of those who have contributed all of the people who have monitored the uh, um, panel discussions and uh, the arrangers and all the new people and the translators and they've done a fantastic job uh, sign language thank you for the public that has uh, shown up uh, so many of you and have uh, held out the whole day and thank you Nupi, which is a very good collaborator Thank you for that. <laughs> Let me also say I want to thank you, Annika Wittel, the foreign uh, minister, for sharing your time with us. And I will also say uh, sharing with us in a, in a helpful way. It's not always that way that politicians are willing to listen to what other people have to say and uh, listen, want to listen to what other people think. So that's a wonderful resource. So many thanks, um, Annika that you would come and be with us. Thank you.